Welcome back to our High Five, where we are celebrating five amazing things that God is doing through the life of One Church. Let's jump into it. Coming in at number five, during our worship service this past Thursday night, uh, we got to celebrate what God is doing in Brittany's life. She said yes to Jesus, and in following him, she was baptized. So this high five goes out to you today, Brittany. In at number four, uh, as we are praying for one, we're often led by God's love in ways that have us connecting people to people. Our Franklin Outpost hosted Get Connected after services last week, and some came to learn about One Church, others interested in connecting in groups and connecting in volunteer opportunities. This high five goes out to everybody in Franklin exploring ways to get connected. Uh, we're really excited for ways in which we can share God's love together. And at number three, people have begun registering for the spring semester of Rooted. You know, now is your chance to embark on this 10 week discipleship journey. In walking through Rooted, you'll come to know God for his character, you'll experience the power of prayer, and you'll discover freedom from life's strongholds. So register now, because registration ends here in February. So sign up at church.one slash Rooted and high five to stronger roots in God's love. And here at number two, a team of One Church staff just returned from a visit to Ozark Christian College in Missouri. During their visit, they met with students interested in the residency program here at One Church. It's really wonderful seeing more and more young leaders growing in ministry. And so this high five, it goes out to all of those students in college connections as they continue to follow God in what he has planned for them next. And finally, in at number one, during worship services at our Manchester Outpost this past Sunday, three people who had given their lives to Jesus were baptized. This includes Angel, Brendan, and Avery. It was a beautiful celebration of their faith in Jesus. And this kingdom-sized high five goes out to you from all of us today. Thank you for joining us for this high five. We can't wait to celebrate with you in the next one. B, B, sometimes in church we can get caught up in do. Sometimes in religion we get caught up in do. What do I need to do? What do I need to achieve? What do I need to chase after? And I can tell you it's exhausting. The invitation that God gives you today is to be. Jesus will say something to his disciples like this. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, be in me. Early on in Genesis chapter 12, God will call a man named Abraham. He'll say, I want you to leave everything that you know, and I want you to come follow me. And he says, and I will bless you. I will bless you. I will bless you. I will be your blessing, and you be. You will be a blessing. You will be a blessing to the people around you. It's like the, the promise that God wants to give us in our lives to you right now, what he is inviting you into is not a whole series of doings. And that's sometimes what we make religion is like, oh, what is the, what, what is the next steps I need to do? And how do I go? How, how do I make my way up the, the, the religious pyramid to get closer and closer to God? And I will tell you, every religion offers that exhausting path. But what Jesus says, he says, come to me. Walk with me. Be in me. Remain in me. Stay close to me. Can I tell you, the secret to life is to be. The secret of life is to be in Jesus. And I can tell you it will, it will work wonders in your marriage if you say, I, I just want to walk closer to Jesus. I just want to be in Jesus. It'll work in your relationships. I just want to be in Jesus. I just want to remain in him. I want to stay connected to him. And like so often in life, we try to figure out all of life's answers. And really, the, the, the clearest thing that you can do in your life is to say, I'm going to be. We're in a series called Conversation Peace. And... We're talking about different conversation pieces that, um, that you might, it, 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 it's a kind of a play on words off of the idea of a conversation piece, something that you talk about, like maybe in your home, a piece of artwork or, or something like that. But, but we're kind of spinning in the sense of conversation piece that God calls us to be ambassadors of peace. That he calls us to be missionaries of peace, to, to let other people know the peace of Jesus so that when you go to school and your classmates, they're, they're struggling to, 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 to fit in the world around them and they feel like, oh, I don't really measure up to the people around me. It's like, no, you can just simply find the peace that comes in Jesus and you can, you can find peace there in your identity of who he says he is. And at work, when there's struggle, there's ups and downs. And in our homes, and there's struggles and ups and downs to find peace and to run after Jesus with everything that we are. Our memory verse comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, and Jesus is on a, 
Jesus is on a hillside talking to a group of people, and he'll say, if you want a happy life, I will show you the path. If you want to figure out what blessing looks like in your life, and you do, like I do, like you would lean in, right? If, like, like I, if you want a blessed life, Jesus will say, this is what it's, what it's to look like. And he'll say something like this down in verse 9. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are willing in their lives to be makers of peace. Willing to say, God, we will be in you and you in us and now you through us and in us. That May you bring peace to the people around us. And I would say that's what God wants for your life is for you to be a person of peace. A peacemaker. And so we're going to read uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. It's there on the screen. Will you read it together with me? <clears throat> it says this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called children of God, sons and daughters of the greatest peacemaker that ever is and ever was, that that while we were enemies with him, he came and made peace with us, and that that, that right now you can have peace with God. And you're like, well, man, I don't measure up. And they say, that's the gift. That's that's the invitation is come be in me. Come be with me, and I I will work my power and strength through you and in you. So we're in Ephesians today. In the book of Ephesians, as we talk about like conversation peace, I know that there's conflict in our world and I know that there's division and there might be division somewhere in your life. There might be conflict somewhere in your life. It probably came to mind, sorry, but it probably came to mind in some sense and I do think God wants to speak something to that. He says, I want, to, I want you to make peace through that. And so what's happening in Ephesus, so Ephesus is a, is a, is a very large city in Asia. Uh, Paul had, had, had helped get a church started there, and they're struggling because they're, they're different people, because people are different, right? And, um, there's Jewish Christians, and there's non-Jewish Christians. There's like a history of tradition from Abraham all the way up to, to, to them, and so there's this rich history, and, and, and so they have the law and the prophet, and they have all these things. And then you have people who have just been brought in by the grace of God. Jesus says that, that when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. And so you have people who have this legacy of belief in religion, and now you have this people who have just like, the door's been thrown open to them, and they're like, how do we get along together? Because you're not us. And so that's, what, that's what's going on in Ephesus. They're like trying to figure this out. And so Paul will write to them in a letter to them called Ephesians, and he'll say, well, here's, here's what I want you to do. First of all, I want you to be holy. I want you to know that the calling that God has for your life is to be holy. And we, we use that word in, in religious circles often, but the word holy is actually a really beautiful word. It's, it's to be set apart. It's like Israel is called in the Old Testament. God says, I'm going to call a people, and I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to... Invite them to be set apart, to be different. We don't have to fight the way the world fights. We can can be different. So in Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul will talk about this idea of being set apart for God's purposes. Paul understood that he was set apart, that he was holy to God. And here's here's what I would tell you. When you know that you were set apart, that you were God's and that he is yours, when your identity is in that and God let our identity be found in you, like right now, every person here right now, Lord, may our identity be found in you, is that when we're set apart, then, then circumstances will come and voices will come and conflict will arise and people will say stuff about you that's not true and, and, and your pride sometimes can be hit sometimes. And, but when you're set apart, when you say, no, I am God and I am God's and he is mine and that, we, that, that I, I can simply be in him and I can be his set apart one, you start to, you'll start to see that there's some beauty there. Why do I say that? Because Paul, as he writes this letter, he's in prison. I don't know about you, but prison is not a place that I would want to be. And yet somehow, this is how he begins chapter 4. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, as a prisoner for the Lord. You see what he says there? He's like, like, it would be tempting to think that I'm now Rome's. I am now Rome's captivity. It would be, it would be tempting that like I, now Rome owns me. And you might think that in, in, in your work, that now they own me. Or you might think that in, in your marriage maybe. You might think that in all of these different areas, like, oh, I am owned by these things. But Paul says, no, when you understand who you are, when you understand that you are a set apart one for God, you're God's, you're his. And so Paul says this, he says, as a prisoner, not for Rome, as a prisoner of the Lord. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I, I urge you. So he's talking, he's talking to the Ephesians, but I also think God's talking to us through this. He says, I urge you to live a life that's worthy of the calling you have received. I urge you to be different. I urge you to, to live differently. And so we get to be, we get to be holy. 
And what does that mean? It's like, well, in terms of making peace, like I don't have to fight like the world fights. I don't have to fight for my own pride. I don't have to. And sometimes I do. Like sometimes I think I have to, right? You do that too. Sometimes you think I got to be right and I got to prove that I'm right and I got to prove that they're wrong. And, 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 but being holy says, no, I don't, I don't have to always plead my own case. I can simply, I can simply be. That idea of holiness, it means like, it means like you're marked. I, you guys remember The Sandlot? Anybody seen the movies The Sandlot? Isn't that like one of the great movies of childhood? Like The Sandlot. And <clears throat> this kid moves to town. I think he had moved to town. I tried to watch a little bit just to brush up on it a little bit. A little, little work, like a little brushing up on The Sandlot. But there's this moment where he kind of wants to... I think he's new to town. You guys could remind me later. But <clears throat> And uh, he's, he, there's a group of kids that play baseball. And, and he's trying to fit in. He can't play baseball to save his life. And, and they lose a ball. They hit a ball over the fence. And there's... a I don't need to tell you the whole story, but they lose a ball. And so he goes home and says, well, I got a ball at home. Again, he's trying to fit in and he grabs a ball. Well, there happens to be a name on the ball. Anybody remember the name on the ball? Bambino. The great Bambino. They're all talking about the great Bambino. But he goes home and he grabs from his stepdad's uh, uh, study. He grabs a ball that's been signed by Babe Ruth. And he goes and he, they take you to the field and they start playing with with a Babe Ruth signed baseball. Well, one of the kids, I think, no, it's actually him. He, he gets up to bat and he wasn't really all that good, but he gets a hold of it and he hits it over a fence where there's a beast of a dog that everybody is terrified to go. And he's like, oh no, it's lost. And his friends, his newfound friends, they're like, what were you thinking? That was the great Bambino. That ball was, and we wouldn't use these words, but that ball was holy. That ball had Babe Ruth's name on it. And you stop and think about what makes something holy. You start to think of it as like, what, what made that ball holy? The, what made the ball holy? It was an ordinary ball that was signed. It had an inscription upon it. And all of a sudden, when it signed, it like changed its purpose. And I think what, what Paul will say is like when you come to Jesus, when you come to him, the living stone, you, you, you start to realize that, that you are a part of him. And, and here, here, here's where it gets beautiful, that his name is upon you, that he has written his name upon you. And now you get to be different because he's different. And so there's a different value that's there. There's this set apartness that you have. And, and so we don't, we don't treat holy things as common. And so Paul will understand his life, and I hope I understand my life, and I hope you understand his life, your life. is God, I want to be yours. God, I want to be set apart at my high school. God, I want to be set apart at my college. God, I want to be set apart within my work. And Lord, if that means that I, blessed are those who are peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God, that your name is written upon me. Lord, may I not take that in vain. We haven't talked about this phrase of taking the Lord's name in vain. And, you know, most of my childhood, you associate, what do you associate it with? You associate it with, oh my God, like taking God's name in vain. But I'm not, I don't, I think that's a very shallow understanding of taking the names Lord in vain. I think what, what the commandment that God had said in, in Exodus was, no, I don't want you to receive me and then forget who you are. I don't want you to take my name upon you. And then, and forget. And so what Paul is saying, he says, he says, I, I, I want you to know church, Ephesus. I want you to know one church conquered. I, I want you to know that you were called to be holy. Now live out a life that's worthy of that calling. You, you, the name of the king is upon you. The name of the king is upon you. And now we get to live that out in our lives. And so, so we get to be holy and set apart for his purposes. Not only do we get to be holy, but, but be complete. I will go on to talk about complete. Um, when you talk about the word peace, the word peace means wholeness, which is kind of interesting. To be whole. And you're longing to be whole. When we say we're wanting peace in our life, like there's, there's something off course. That, and, and usually what happens in our world is we try to fill it with something else. It's like I, I feel like something's missing and I need some type of peace in my life. And, and yet Paul will say, no, no, your wholeness is already there in God. I, I, he can lead you to peace. And so this is what he goes on to write. He says, he says um, verse 2, be completely humble. 
He doesn't say be partially humble. He doesn't say be humble sometimes. He doesn't say pick the person with which you are going to be humble because we do that sometimes, right? It's like, wow, well, I don't really like this person and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be prideful over here or I know this person really well and, and, and they can deal with it or handle it and notice this. I want you to be completely humble. I want you to be completely humble. Let me keep reading through it. Uh, be completely humble. Be gentle. And you're like, okay, how do I make peace? Scripture is so beautiful. It's like, how, what is the pathway to peace? Well, he says, I want, you, I want you to know that you're set apart. I want you to know that you're called to live different. I want you to know that you are, you are, you are God's possession. You are his. So, so now be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. That's hard sometimes, right? Be patient. Who God do you want us to be patient with right now? Be patient. Help us to bear with one another. Anybody got to bear with right now? Bear, bear with one another. Bear with one another in love. And so Paul will say to this group of people, like you're struggling and, and, and there's people that make you mad and, and you want to you, 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 you want to make war sometimes and you're ready to fall into conflict. And we do. And I, I have been saying sometimes we step into conflict and some flight, sometimes conflict comes to us. And how do we navigate it? How do we how do we move through it? Well, we first understand, well, God's name is upon me that I'm a son or daughter of the king, that he is a peacemaker. So now I am a peacemaker. Now he's, he's called me to completeness in him. And so what does completeness look like? And so before beginning, before beginning a conversation, before beginning that fight that you're ready to get into, before sending that text that you're ready to send or the post on social media that you so want to send, the, 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 before any of that, I think Paul's verse two, he'll help us to understand, okay, how do I be complete and what does complete look like? He says, be completely humble. I don't know about you, but that's a task. Be completely humble. What is Humility. Humility is understanding that I am not the center of the universe. Humility is understanding that I don't have everything right. Humility is understanding of like, okay, there are people <laughs> living among me, <laughs> living with me, that, 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 that they have thoughts and ideas and feelings as well. And, and, and maybe I'm not right all the time, right? That's a hard belief sometimes, right? It's like, maybe we're not right all the time. Maybe, maybe there's some information that, that I can glean from them as well. And so I'm going to humble myself and say, be, be humble because, well, be a humblebee. Don't be a bumblebee. Bumblebees. Bumblebees bumble. Bumblebees bumble into conflict. Bumblebees bumble into crises. Bumblebees like fall into conflict and chaos sometimes. And Paul will say, no. Be different. God help us to be different. God help us to battle different. You're like, well, what do you mean battle different? God help us to fight not with weapons of this world, but help us to to fight through, through prayer and fight through a fierce listening to your spirit and what you're wanting to do in our lives. Lord, help us to fight by saying, no, I'm going to go against the voices in my head, but instead I'm going to decide that I'm going to be a maker of peace in this situation. You, you define your situation, but I'm going to be a maker of peace. And that, that might be hard and it might be difficult. And so I got to fight myself sometimes. I got to fight my pride. I got to fight all of that. And so, so be humble, be a humble, be not a, not a bumblebee. It goes on to say, and, and, and these, it's kind of interesting because these are all, um, we may not view them all the time as the, the, I don't know, the most attractive things in light of our pride. But we're called not only to be, um, be humble, but also to be gentle. Gentle, like gentleness is, well, sometimes we don't want to be gentle. Sometimes I want to be clearly understood, right? Sometimes, and sometimes that clearly understood can come with a little bit of heat behind it. Sometimes I want to be right and people to know that I'm right. Like, but be gentle. Sometimes we associate gentle with weakness, and that's the problem that we have with it, right? It's like, I, I don't want to be weak. I don't want to perceive, be perceived as weak. I don't want to be the weaker one in this relationship. And, but, but that's not what gentleness means. Gentleness means strength under control. Like you have strength. The strength of God is at work in your life. 
the power of God is in you. And, and so now how do you bring that under control? God, where are you calling me? Where are you calling us to bring strength under control in our relationships so that we can be gentle with one another? I praise God that he is gentle to us. Man, I don't know about you, but God has been so gentle to me in my life. You've, you've had the same moments that I've had. It's like, man, at what moment is the lightning going to come from the sky? <laughs> you've had those moments. Like, God, I don't know why <laughs> that I am still here. Have you had those moments? Like, like, it seems like a long time ago. You probably should have been done with me. And yet, that's not how God is. It says that the, the kindness of God. Please hear this. Maybe, you're, maybe that's where you are right now. You're waiting for the lightning bolts. And can I tell you, you're in a room full of people that probably at some point in their lives have been waiting for them too. But what scripture will say is that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. That when we start to see the goodness and gentleness of God, it leads us to say, God, if you're going to love me like that, how could I not love you? God, if you're going to be so faithful to me, how could I not make a decision to be faithful to you and to trust you? And so be gentle. Be a gentle bee. So you've got to remove the stingers. You've got to get the stingers out. And maybe you got some. Maybe you've, you've had some stingers, those biting words, those biting remarks. And you don't have to live in the past, but going forward, God, how do you want me to be gentle? The next one's equally difficult sometimes is to be patient. To be patient with people. To be patient in life, I suppose, as well. To be completely patient. Remember, we're going back to that completely word. Be complete. Be completely humble, which is tough. Be completely gentle, which is tough. Be completely patient, which is really tough, right? Like, because, because we're immediate. We're instant gratification. We want it done as, as fast as possible. And people, people are slow. People are, other than us, they're slow, like, getting to the results we want in them. And, and what Paul will say is, no, be patient. Be patient with one another. Be patient with I was going to say God, like, but that's true too. Because sometimes we can end up being a bunch of busy bees. We can just run around like, I'm mixing metaphors, I was like chicken with their heads cut off. Bees with their buzzings, I don't know. Don't be a busy bee. Be patient. God is not slow as we view slowness but he's patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish. Hear that, hear that. God is patient with us. Why? Because he is after the good, his good for everyone. Be patient with one another. Why? Because we are his children who are after the good of others. And so the people that come to your minds, like are, are, are you know, I don't mean this in a, it's just maybe hopefully in a helpful way, is like, are you patient with them? Are you gentle with them? Are you humble before them? And like all of a sudden you're like, this is, this is kind of a hard, hard word. This is kind of a hard message. This is a hard life to live. And, and you're like, well, how do I do this? Well, the temptation would become to go the religious route and say, I'm just going to start doing. Which the doing is not bad, but if the being is not there. Let's say, no, draw near to Jesus and let his character start to shape you. And flow through you. And so the last one is be loving. Bear with one another. And maybe that's something that you don't really want to hear right now because you're you bore enough of somebody. But, but no, God used us to, to bear with one another. Lord, help us to, to love one another. Help us to be loving in our relationships. And so bless you. <laughs> And so be holy, be set apart, be complete. And then finally, be united. Be united with one another. Bees all, um, bees are all different, which, but, but bees are, bees all, I, I was reading facts about bees. Some strange facts about bees. They got five eyes. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? I don't know what they got five eyes for, but they got five eyes. Um, they can't see red. Some of them, he was just telling me that bees can't see red. I thought, oh, that fits with anger. Bees can't see red. Bee, be one who can't see red. <laughs> um, the, way they, the way they talk to each other, I'm not going to do it. They dance. Isn't that kind of cool? 
Bees, when they talk to each other, they have this little dance. Like they're watching each other and, and, and they're dancing with one another. So they're different and yet they talk to each other because they're, they're united in purpose. The, the, the purpose of the hive and the making honey and the pollen and all of that stuff. And so, so, so the way they, they, they communicate with each other is, is how they dance with one another. They'll linger and they'll move. And it's like their GPS systems as they're talking to each other. There's just this dance that, take, that takes place. And I, you know, I realize we're all walking around with stingers and we're all, we've all got this mission. And so we could get focused either on the mission or we could get focused on the stinging. Um, and so how do you do it? Well, it's a dance. Unity is a dance. Marriage, unity is a dance. Work, it's a dance. It's learning, it's okay, we're different, but we're in something together. And so this is what he goes on to say. He says, oh man, the first three words... The first three words, I think, are con convicting enough to just put in your pocket and go home. It's like, make every effort. Well, what's the effort? Because I thought it was not about doing. What is the effort we're to make? Make every effort to hold on so tightly to Jesus that he starts to shape your relationships with one another, that he starts to, to, to be the one who flows through them. And he will. That's a promise that I think he gives, is that he can, he can do wonders. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Why? Because we're one. There is one body, and there is one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the firm foundation upon, we, upon which we all stand. We are all desperately in need of Him. That We are all recipients of His grace, and now we are all participants in, in, in his, his love towards one another. And so... Paul's writing to this group of people and I think he wants to speak to me and he wants to speak to you. He's like, make every effort to keep the unity. Unity is already there. We're already united in Jesus. His, the same spirit that lives in you is the same spirit that lives, if, if they're in Jesus, lives in the same person you're mad at right now and you're united with them even if you don't want to be or even if you don't like it. You are united with them and so Paul will say, well, since you're one with each other, work it out. Struggle through it because I do think there's value in the, in the right types of battles. I do think there are relationships that are worth fighting for. and I'm not sure that we always make every effort. And so to a group of Christians struggling about all their differences and all the opinions going around and all the things that are so easy and fast to fight in, Paul will say, man, you guys are so, you are united in so many things. Don't let the subtle things tear you all apart. So he says, make every effort to keep the unity through the bond of peace. Because there's one Lord, there's one Father, there's one baptism, there's one God who's over all and through all and in all. And he unites us all together. And so you got to kind of live with a hive mentality. you got to live with a, a hive mentality. It's like we are, we are in this together, that we have this mission of helping more and more people know the love of Jesus, to know that His grace is for them, that Jesus came to this earth to, to give His life for each and every one of us, that anyone who believes in Him, who receives Him, shall not perish, but find life in Him, so that we can be transformed to a religion of doing, to a religion of being and receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And then, then He starts to bring the transformation through us, because it's not as though, if you read the book of James, it's not as though um, that we're not called to things. In fact, He'll say, live a life worthy of the call that you have received, but it's no longer um, trying to save ourselves, but it's God saying, no, I have saved you, and now let that salvation work its way out into all of your little relationships. And so, a hive has a queen. We don't have a queen, but we have a king. And we get to be invited into his mission and into his purposes. And so at one church, we pray for one. We say, Lord, please give me one person to share your love with. We all pray that prayer with me. Lord, please give me one person to share your love with. And the idea is like we have a king and his king has, the king has given us a calling. And he says, it's very, it's, it's very much like Genesis chapter 12. Matthew 28, some of Jesus' last words. He says, all power, all authority has been given to me. Now, as you go, does, it, the, the translation says go, but it's really as you go, as you go about your life, be. Make disciples. 
help other people hear the message of Jesus in their lives. And so we get to do that. And part of that is, is sharing of what he has done for us. In a time of communion, we, we take a piece of bread and Jesus will say, this is my life that's been given for you. And whenever you do this, may you do this remembering me. This is our king who came to make peace. Kings, particularly powerful kings, particularly powerful kings who have the power to destroy the enemy, you would think that they would come in war, but instead our king came in peace. He came to bring peace between us and God, and so it's through his death, it's through his burial, it's through his resurrection that we find life in him, we take to the king. He took the juice, he says, this is my blood poured out for you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we remember you. We thank you, King Jesus. Would you all stand with me? Maybe you're here today and maybe you're here today and you're not at peace. Peace is offered to you. Peace with God, peace with one another. We'd love to be able to pray with you. We'll have someone over here, someone, or I'll be down here if there's any way we can uh, be praying for you. We would love to do that. If today's the day you want to step into peace, if you want to say, I, I want Jesus to be my king, I want my identity to be found in him, I want to be set apart for his purposes. I've tried my way and I, I, it, I've, I've seen its fruit, but now I want to walk in his way. Over here we have water. We have towels, we have t-shirts. If you'd like to be baptized into Jesus Christ, that's a beautiful invitation he gives us. And so um, there's no reason to wait. We invite you to do that. You'll notice in front of you there's a connect card. We, um, we'd like to know who you are. We'd like to know anything that we could be praying for for you. Uh, we do go through them as a staff and as elders. And, and we do pray for all the ones that you were praying for so that we as a hive, we get to do this together for the sake of our king. And so we lift up the names that you write down. And so we can lift up those names together. Um, you can turn those in in the... Um, the boxes in the back. Um, we all pray with me. Father God, I thank you for um, for being a God who humbled himself, came in gentleness, filled with patience, bearing with us. Lord, I thank you that, I, I pray that even now in this moment that we might ponder, that we might think about the, the amazing grace that you've given to us, that you've shown to us, that we are wonderful, beautiful recipients of life and love and power and strength. And Father, I pray that as you said to Abraham and as you said to Israel and as you said to your church in Ephesians, that it may not stop with us, but that it might pour through us into other people so that we might be that we might be a kingdom of priests, that we might be a holy nation, that we might be a people that you've called for yourself. And so, Lord, use us in those ways this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, will you please stand with us?
surrounding you with limits of what my eyes could see. God, would you forgive me, restore the mystery? makes a way. I'm reminded of Isaiah 43 verse 16 and the Lord says he's the one who takes us through the waters through challenges 
So whatever you're going through, we encourage you to trust the way maker, amen? Whether it's in your family, your life, you're struggling with something in your mind, your heart, we're so grateful for that. We encourage you also to find someone to share God's love with, someone close to you, a family member, a friend, someone you know or don't know. So God bless you guys. Have a great week.